love, not disdain. Pope Francis is in Bulgaria and delivers a message to migrants and the country's government. Threat of tariffs. President Donald Trump issues an economic warning to China and the global markets react. We're at the White House. Still not safe. For the second week in a row, Catholics in Sri Lanka do not attend Sunday Mass. And birthplace of a saint. The Holy Father is set to visit a museum in North Macedonia dedicated to Mother Teresa. We have a preview. On EWTN News Nightly for Monday, May 6th, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Thank you to those of you joining me from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Pope Francis is in Bulgaria. It is his fourth international trip of the year, and his visit has been focused on the plight of refugees and relations with the Orthodox Church. Located in southeastern Europe, Bulgaria is the poorest of the European Union's 28 nations. The Holy Father ended today at an interreligious service dedicated to peace around the world. We are the children. We are the ones who make a brother. It was the Holy Father's final public event before he leaves for North Macedonia. In his remarks, he praised St. Francis of Assisi for loving the beauty and creation and everyone he encountered. Pope Francis told a group of refugees, including those from Iraq and Pakistan, that their pain is like the cross carried by Christ. He met with the refugees at a school refurbished with funds from the European Union on the outskirts of Sofia, Bulgaria's capital. One Syrian refugee asked the Pope to pray for an end to the war there. I'm the cousin, uh, the Holy Father also reached out to Bulgaria's tiny Catholic population, which represents just under 1% of about 7 million people. Earlier today, Pope Francis celebrated a First Communion Mass for about 250 jittery children in Rakovsky, Bulgaria. He asked the children who filled the pews of Sacred Heart Church if they were excited. Siete contenti voi de fare la prima comunione? Sì. Sicuro? Sicuro come le tua. And the children responded with a rousing yes. Pope Francis doesn't typically administer first communion. When the Pope arrived yesterday, he respectfully suggested that Bulgarians open their hearts and homes to migrants who knock at their door. Mi permetto di suggerire di non chiudere gli occhi. Non chiudere il cuore. And he met with the leader of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Neophyte. Relations with the Catholic and Orthodox Church are cordial, <clears throat> but not close. Coming up later in the broadcast, we'll look at the Holy Father's itinerary for tomorrow and how it fits in with Mother Teresa. The global markets take a hit today after President Trump threatened to slap more tariffs on China. It's a bad sign for trade talks between the two countries, which are set to begin Wednesday. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. China says its negotiators are still preparing to travel here to Washington. Despite President Trump's tweet, he could be putting more pressure on them to reach an agreement ahead of Wednesday's trade talks. President Trump says the higher tariffs China now pays to send products to the U.S. are helping our economy. Writing on Twitter, these payments are partially responsible for our great economic results. And more tariffs could be coming, including plans to more than double the tariffs on $200 billion in Chinese products. Those fees would jump from 10 percent to 25 percent as of Friday. That announcement caused financial markets to plunge and alarmed Chinese trade officials. Their visit scheduled this week would continue another round of talks aimed at ending the tariff war and reaching a trade deal. The engagements, the discussions will continue on all the key subjects, all the key subjects, including enforcement, of course. There are so many unknowns at this point. Aaron Ennis with the U.S.-China Business Council says it's not clear if a compromise between the U.S. and China can be reached, but the claim from President Trump that tariffs have helped the economy isn't true. 
data across the board suggests that we aren't seeing significant improvements in the economy thanks to tariffs. What we are seeing is some stunting of growth. Ennis says negotiators have made progress trying to convince China to stop stealing U.S. intellectual property, but the use of tariffs isn't an effective way to reach a better trade deal. Meanwhile, the president says the United States has been losing for many years $600 to $800 billion a year on trade. With China, we lose $500 billion. Sorry, we're not going to be doing that anymore. China has responded to U.S. tariffs with its own penalties on $110 billion of American goods, and that could increase after the president's latest threat of more tariffs. The president could be using this tariff threat as leverage in trade talks to get the deal he wants with China. Now, the expert we spoke with also said, also said it's possible the Chinese made an offer to the president he finds insufficient, so he will increase these tariffs. But up to this point, we've seen the administration signal steady progress in these negotiations. Lauren. White House correspondent Mark Irons. Thank you, Mark. As we just heard, tariff threats tanked global markets today. But the overall economy has, in the U.S. has been booming, and that's good news for President Trump's chances of re-election and is driving Democrats to debunk what appears to be that good news. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi tells us why. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Lauren. History is on the president's side. Uh, since World War II, an incumbent president has never lost a re-election bid in the midst of a growing economy. The Labor Department says unemployment is now at a five-decade low of 3.6 percent. That jobless rate does not include people who stopped looking for work. Democrats say the economy isn't good enough. Signs of life for the economy. It grew 3.2 percent the first three months of the year. But is the Trump administration driving that growth? They might deserve a little bit of credit, but at the end of the day, I think they've done more to you know, risk uh, crashing the economy than to actually deserve credit for the positives going on. Voters in Battleground, Michigan, looked to 2020. It has to have something to do with them. You know, I mean, if you don't mind me saying I did vote for them, um, there's things that I like and I don't like, just like with every president, you know, but you have to give them some kind of credit for the situation. The 21 Democratic candidates face this economy, so they point to problems. Americans are struggling. Their wages are too low. We're decades low. For the last four decades, I don't think they've budged that much. A lot of people aren't sharing in this prosperity because of the cost, the cost of college, the cost of health care, uh, the fact that the president had promised that he would bring down the prices of their prescription drugs, and that just hasn't happened. In Iowa? Senator Bernie Sanders unveils his plan to break up big farming monopolies. Family farmers are going bankrupt and in many ways are being treated like modern day indentured servants. Democrats still have to compete with each other for the party's nomination. Early frontrunner Joe Biden says there's one goal. Above all else, we must defeat Donald Trump. A CNN poll finds 56% of Americans approve of the president's handling of the economy, but only 43% like his overall job. And Lauren, Senator Cory Booker today released a gun control plan. He wants the federal government to license all gun owners. That would include an interview and safety training. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey. Thank you, Jason. The House Judiciary Committee will vote Wednesday to hold Attorney General William Barr in contempt of Congress. That's for not releasing an unredacted version of special counsel Robert Mueller's report into possible collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign. This is the latest in an escalating battle between the Democrat-led House and President Trump. Democrats have been demanding Mueller testify. The president tweeted yesterday he would oppose Mueller's testimony. Israel and militant forces in Gaza agree to a ceasefire after a weekend of violence that left more than one dozen dead and hundreds more injured. It marks the deadliest fighting between the two sides since the 2014 war. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reports from the State Department. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says Israelis have every right to defend themselves. He's condemning the two terrorist organizations operating in Gaza, Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, for starting the fighting. Now innocent Israelis and Palestinians caught in the crossfire are mourning their lost loved ones. A disturbing scene as a Palestinian family mourns the death of a four-month-old baby. 
killed in an Israeli airstrike. Throughout the day, Palestinians have been holding funerals for the 23 who died. On the Israeli side, four civilians were killed by incoming fire, the first Israeli fatalities from rocket fire since the 50-day war in 2014. Blaze Mishdal is a Middle East and terrorism expert. It's a very tense situation, um, but also one that both sides are trying really hard not to escalate. The Palestinian Prime Minister welcomed efforts by the Egyptians to negotiate the ceasefire. He's asked the United Nations to stop Israeli aggression against the Palestinians. But the Israeli Prime Minister and U.S. officials say Hamas and Islamic Jihad are the ones to blame. On Friday, Palestinians on the Gaza border fired gunshots at two Israeli soldiers. The fight escalated over the next two days as Palestinian militants fired 700 rockets into Israel and the Israeli military responded with airstrikes on dozens of targets inside Gaza. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Hamas is paying a heavy price for launching rockets into Israel. But some Israelis say Netanyahu hasn't done enough, arguing the military should enter Gaza and take out all the terrorists. But Mishdal says that's not likely to happen. He says Israel can't afford to focus all their attention on Gaza because of threats from terrorists in Lebanon. That's one of the reasons I think the Israelis are concerned, not even so much about Hamas, but Hezbollah that has 10 hundreds times more rockets than Hamas does. And so Israel really wants to keep the peace in the south as much as it can. Palestinians living in Gaza are suffering from a ravaged economy. In March, some took to the streets in Gaza to protest Hamas rule. Hamas's leader says they are not interested in a new war. Today is the start of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, which some experts say might lessen the motivation for war. Lauren? Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the State Department. Thank you, Wyatt. Catholics in Sri Lanka celebrate Sunday Mass at home for the second week in a row. Churches remain closed and under heavy security amid fears of another terror strike by Islamic extremists. At least 250 people were killed in bombings on Easter Sunday. The faithful were allowed to gather outside St. Anthony's Church in Colombo to light candles and pray. Catholic priests in Venezuela held a candlelit vigil yesterday for at least five people killed in street clashes. The violent confrontations followed opposition leader Juan Guaido's failed call for a military uprising last week. Venezuela's government has accused Guaido of causing the bloodshed. Coming up, how a Catholic group is helping those affected by the devastating cyclones in Mozambique. The southern African nation of Mozambique suffered two devastating cyclones in just six weeks. More than 600 people have died, thousands are homeless, and now the country is battling an outbreak of deadly diseases like cholera and malaria. 30% of Mozambique's population is Catholic. And joining me now is Mauro Garofalo, International Relations Officer for the Community of Sant'Egidio, a Catholic group focused on prayer, peace, and helping the poor. Welcome to our broadcast. Thank you. I hope I said Good it right. Sant, Sant Egidio. Egidio. Sant Egidio. St. Giles, but we do not translate the name. Ah, St. Giles. Oh, your group has a very long relationship with Mozambique, and as a matter of fact, you have a medical facility there that was destroyed or damaged by the cyclones. How are, how is everybody doing, and, and how are you helping others? Well, this is a very difficult moment for the country, especially the northern part because of the uh, cyclone Idao. And we are, as you said, we have a long history of friendship with the country since the 80s, where the first communities were established in Mozambico community of Sant'Egidio. We have this big project for uh, treating HIV and opportunistic disease. And as a matter of fact, our program was struck by uh, the cyclone. Tell us about that. It was a medical facility there? Yeah, there was a... I think we have some pictures we can show. Yeah, there is um, a laboratory and a dream center we call DREAM, which means a disease relief through excellent and accessible means. Um, that was... Look at these pictures. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's really quite something. It was a huge power. This, this is one of our responsible in of Mozambique, uh, Sant'Egidio, Mozambique. As a matter of fact, our center, who provide treatments for HIV, became a shelter for hundreds of uh, refugees that were escaping because now the city is under the, the sea level. It's, it's under the sea level yeah, right now. It's because still of underwater. The, right, wow. So there is you, a lack of uh, fresh, fresh water now. 
uh, you've been working on a vaccination campaign yeah. to prevent the spread of cholera exactly caused by the contaminated water after the cyclone so tell me how many people have you reached what are the next steps hundreds hundreds also be because of the presence of the dream project we know the population we know the villages around the city so we can spread the vaccination program and this is the phase mm -hmm. one of the age relief there are be now there is be in front of us we have the reconstruction phase which of course will be now huge. you have to keep going right yeah. the pope is going to mozambique in yeah. september it's his fourth visit to africa what kind of challenges do catholics face there other than the cyclone well it's a country that has been going under a long period of reconciliation there has been a civil war in mozambique that lasted for 17 years and ended and ended in 1992 uh, with an agreement that was signed in Rome under the mediation of the community of Sant'Egidio. It is a country that is developing fast. There is a huge problem of uh, sharing resources and is a country vastly Catholic, as you said. So it, it can be the future, one of the future of the church in, uh, in Africa, and it is really interesting, and we are all waiting for the visit of the Pope. Thank you so much for joining us, Mauro Garofalo, International Relations Officer for the community of Sant'Egidio. Gidio. Perfect. Perfect. I Thank got you. It. Thank you. Up next, Pope Francis greets new recruits for the Swiss Guard. Why there are worries about the group's future. And a look inside a museum dedicated to Mother Teresa, ahead of a visit from the Holy Father. The White House announced new regulations last week protecting health providers from medical procedures where they have religious or moral objections. The new rule requires hospitals, universities, clinics and other institutions that receive federal funding to certify they will comply with some 25 federal laws protecting conscious and religious rights. Dr. Gracie Christie, Senior Policy Advisor for the Catholic Association, joins me now via Skype from Miami. Gracie, welcome back to our broadcast. Thanks for having me on again, Lauren. Explain to the audience how this new rule is different from what existed before. Weren't medical professionals already protected? No, medical professionals were not protected. And in the last few years, there's been there have been very definite changes in the practice of medicine. Things that that we never accepted before as doctors and nurses. Things like assisted suicide. Uh, are becoming legal, and we're expected to operate under those new rules. And many of us just can't just can't do that. It's against our consciences. I interviewed President Trump's press secretary, Sarah, Sander, Sarah Sanders, last week. She told me the president wants to do everything he can to protect life and that it's one of the fundamentals of our society and one of the most important parts of who America is. Has the issue of conscience protection become more urgent since the passage of the New York abortion law and New Jersey's assisted suicide law? Well, look, right now, one in five Americans lives in a jurisdiction that allows assisted suicide. Assisted suicide. That means that all those doctors and all those nurses and all those health entities have to participate. They're expected to participate. And we are simply not equipped mentally, morally, social, you know, socially and, and religiously to participate in the death of one of our patients. So we really need those protections, whether it's at the beginning of life with abortion or at the end of life with terminal illnesses and assisted suicide. Medical advances are constantly happening and changing, but just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So as a healthcare professional, do you feel that that line is getting blurrier? Well, sure. The first thing we need to do as health professionals is to not do any harm. And unfortunately, there's some therapies out there that are being proposed for things like gender dysphoria, people who feel that they're the opposite sex. And these therapies are really experimental at this point, and they mutilate patients and change their lives in dramatic ways. So not all doctors, for me, for instance, uh, we're not all comfortable with participating in these things. So we do need protection from the law, and this is a great move from the Trump administration. I know that you talk to young professionals, young Catholic professionals a lot, who are considering a career in medicine. What are they telling you? Are they wavering? No, I get phone calls all the time from people who know that I'm a pro-life doctor, and they call me, young people, sometimes in college and sometimes in medical school, and they say, is it even safe to practice medicine? Or if I go into medicine, are there certain fields that I need to stay away from? And I say, you know what, it's, it's getting a little, it's getting very narrow, the space where a pro-life a uh, Hippocratic medicine doctor or nurse can practice their field without fear. But this new rule from the Trump administration is seeking to keep that space as wide as possible. 
Dr. Gracie Christie, Senior Policy Advisor for the Catholic Association. Always great to have you with us. Thank you, Lauren. 23 Swiss Guards met Pope Francis Saturday, just days before an annual swearing-in ceremony. Their job is to protect the Holy Father, but their leader says the group is facing an uncertain future. Quest'anno abbiamo purtroppo solo 23 guardie. Commander Christoph Graf says about 40 more guards are needed. The lack of recruits is credited in part to the strong economy and low unemployment in Switzerland. Soldiers wearing their traditional striped uniforms and feathered helmets gather inside the Vatican, and today they took that oath to protect the Holy Father. This group was founded in 1506. Let's hope they can continue recruiting. And finally tonight, Mother Teresa is best known for her work in the slums of Calcutta in India, but she was born in what is now called North Macedonia. Tomorrow the Holy Father is going to pay a visit to that country and to a museum dedicated to one of the most beloved figures in church history. EWTM Rome Bureau Chief Alan Holdren gives us a sneak peek. A museum dedicated to Mother Teresa in Skopje stands on the site of the church where she was baptized. Built in 2009, visitors pay respects to the tiny nun who changed the world. We've got uh, visitors from all over the world and the first thing that uh, when they heard that she was from here, she, she was not from India, it's very peculiar for them. She was born Agnes Goncha Boyachu in North Macedonia in 1910, the youngest of three children. At the age of 18, she joined the Sisters of Loreto, an Irish order of nuns with missions in India. In 1929, she moved to Calcutta, and in 1950, Mother Teresa started her own order, the Missionaries of Charity. Their main task, to love and care for the poor. In 2016, Pope Francis declared Mother Teresa a saint. Now he'll be paying homage to her with a visit to her museum. He'll also pray in its chapel. The museum's director, who's Muslim, says that he will pray alongside the Holy Father. I would like to, to do a prayer, uh, him in, in his religion and I in my religion, to do it together. It'll be a short trip, just one day to the Balkan nation. The former Macedonian ambassador to the Holy See says the country has been waiting for a papal visit. He calls the Pope's visit to this former communist country historic and says expectations are high. There will be a main, uh, main prayer at the stadium of, of the city and we are expecting about 40, 50,000 people for that day, not just from Macedonia, for, for other countries as well. Mother Teresa's legacy is expected to be the main focus of the trip. In Rome, Alan Holdren, EWTN News Nightly. What a great trip that's going to be. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Let's keep in touch online. Follow me at Lauren Ashburn on Twitter and at Lauren Ashburn EWTN on Facebook. Good night and God bless you.